Okay, it's going live, but it's not showing up on the... How is the banana? <laughs> I haven't had anything, so I had to eat something. <laughs> and the banana is good, always a good. <laughs> Happy New Year! It's not the New Year? But there's a countdown. It is It is a good countdown. Oh, okay. <laughs> God, you know, I think a lot of people wish it was 2021 already. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, uh, and our... Live stream is going great, so oh, this is fantastic. Uh, well, welcome 
everybody, uh, people who are joining us here on Zoom and on the YouTube live stream to Nerd Night Kansai number 16 with, uh, in collaboration with uh, Conserve Session. This is our second time that we've collaborated uh, with the Kyoto University student group. I think it was about this time last year that we did it one day last time. When, but that was with people together uh, here in Kyoto too. So let's hope uh, we can do that again sometime soon. Uh, my name is Raymond Terhun, one of the uh, organizers of Nerd Night Kansai. We have a lot of repeaters here, but it's you know just a quick explanation of what we do. We are just a, a group of people who try to have some fun talks uh, monthly. You know, about two or three, and one of the only rules we have is that uh, we have to have you have to have alcohol <laughs> here with you to share a drink and to share some nice educational talks and some laughs. Uh, let me introduce uh, my co-organizer, Katie. Please. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm Katie. I hope you all have a great time today. Thank you very much, Raymond, for organizing this one and all everyone at Conserve Session. Uh, our last time was really great. So yeah, I think today's also going to be a lot of fun. Thank you. Uh, so basic, uh, how this is going to go uh, before I introduce cons uh, concert session organizers and have them talk about uh, what that, their student organization is. Uh, we're going to have two 20-minute uh, talks uh, from uh, some astounding uh, speakers and individuals. From there, uh, we'll then open the floor to a 10 minute Q&A session. Uh, we'll take questions from people who are entering first the uh, Zoom meeting uh, initially. If, and people who are joining us, you can uh, write in the chat your question, or you know, we encourage you to unmute, unmute yourself and you know, uh, talk to the speaker directly. Uh, from there, we'll take questions from people on the YouTube live stream. Uh, Katie, could you please take uh, keep an eye on that? And uh, there's a slight delay, about 20 seconds between uh, the question, the YouTube and our Zoom. So there's going to be a little bit slight discrepancy on how soon we can uh, deal with the questions on YouTube. So uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, toss this down to uh, and a great and Vanessa, our representatives from uh, Conserve Session. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Raymond. Um, thank you everyone for joining today. Um, as Raymond was talking, I'm Anna Gret from uh, Kyoto University. I'm a member of Conserve Session. Um, so we're basically a student organization. Uh, so students and postdocs, and we try to raise awareness about animal conservation, welfare, and uh, in general, environmental issues. And uh, we try to do this by organizing a variety of events targeted towards a variety of audiences. Um, and this includes things like film screenings, public talks, uh, photo exhibitions, and more. And of course, uh, collaborations like this with wonderful people like Nerd Night. Um, and yeah, so this is our second collaboration with Nerd Night Kansai. Um, I'm really excited uh, for this one. And yeah, the last one was in fall before all the crazy madness. So we were able to have it face to face, but um, I'm really happy that we can still collaborate even these difficult times um, online this time. But yeah, um, I really like to thank Raymond and Katie, the organizers for making this possible today. Um, and I'm joined here with uh, Vanessa and I guess you can also see Cecile in the screen, but they're also um, members of Conserve Session at uh, Kyoto University, and uh, will be kind of uh, helping to moderate this event on Zoom. So um, yeah, thanks again for joining. And I guess, uh, may I introduce the first speaker or, yeah? Yes, please uh, introduce our first speaker. Yeah, yeah. Conserve Session, uh, your group was the one who kind of uh, found found the speakers uh, this round. So yes, I think it's appropriate for uh, <laughs> you guys to introduce them. All right, thank you very much. Okay, then without any further ado, um, the first speaker for tonight is uh, uh, let's see, uh, Marie Siegel. 
from the uh, Primate Research Institute at Kyoto University. Um, she's a postdoc uh, working on the wildlife trade. Uh, and the title of her talk is The Anaconda in the Living Room, What's Wrong with the Exotic Pet Trade? Um, yeah, please enjoy, take it away. Okay, so I guess I'm gonna start sharing uh, my screen. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, go ahead yeah. and share your screen. I'm sorry. Um, first time here for an online session, so I'm a bit, uh, I'm a bit a newbie here. So, um, okay, okay. So, thanks everybody for um, attending that talk. Just to give you a little bit more background about myself. So I'm a veterinarian and I'm a behavioral ecologist and I work on several wildlife species, including slow lorries. It's actually the slow lorries that made me talk about this subject tonight because slow lorries are, um, are um, facing many threats. And one of them is to be, because they are being poached, retrieved from the natural habitat to be sell in the exotic pet trade. So, this is what triggered my interest into that topic, and this is what I'm gonna why I'm gonna talk about it today and try to explain you what is wrong with it. So first thing first, um, exotic pet trade is actually part of a wider phenomenon uh, that is called the wildlife trade. Wildlife trade is a multi-billionaire industry where products derived from non-domesticated plants or animals are sold are sold to to finish in your, in your living room, basically. And this can be alive or dead specimens, such as furniture made of rosewood or fur coat or any, any decoration made of like, made of uh, elephant ivory, like those statues, or even a cactus. And exotic pets are part of that big phenomenon. So exotic pets, such as parrots, turtles, frogs, snake, or many other kinds of species, Briefly, what is an exotic pet? Um, it's simply a species that, uh, an animal that belongs to a species that has not been domesticated. So to take a very easy example, um, but dog being a domesticated species and the wolf being his uh, wild, wild ancestor, it's actually very different. I mean, um, you can tame a wild animal to get it accustomed to, long, to live alongside humans, but it will never be the same as with a domesticated species that has been selected uh, to, to tolerate humans, for example, or that has been selected to be a nice pet, like dogs. For example, dogs are more tractable, more trainable, they are more submissive, and they are more tolerant to humans. So this is just a, a quick example or different uh, domesticated, non-domesticated species are. So to go back to the exotic pet train, it's a phenomenon that is increasing in numbers, meaning that more and more individuals enter the, 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 the trade to be sell as pets, and it's millions of individuals every year. But it's also increasing in diversity. It means that there is more and more species that are offered to be traded, and it's, it's thousands of species. To give you an example, um, uh, about 800,000 American household own a pet snake. And Japan imported over 260,000 live birds within a decade. So it's a, it's a very large phenomenon. We could ask the question why um, people are looking for exotic pets. So I'm going to share my own guess with you guys tonight. And the first one I think of is cuteness. For sure, some species are selected because they are considered as cute. This is the case for the slow loris, but for many other species like otters, sugar gliders, cat gecko, or even sloths. Some people are more interested in excitement. I bet it must be exciting to have a bison in your living room, or a tiger, or an anaconda in the living room, or even a cheetah, or even a black mamba. 
some people are more into rarity or strangeness and those people are gonna are gonna choose in um pets such as radiated tortoise or or rare salamanders or even tamandua tamandua being a, a species coming from south america now the question is why does it matter why do we care if people choose to have one of those exotic species in their living room first it's a matter of safety most of these animals have very specific requirement and it's actually a hard job to keep them in general and to keep them at home especially and there is numerous accidents with it numbers of animals exotic pets actually kill their owners so this is two very graphic examples but i have gathered a couple of other examples for you like horrific pet chimp attack on a woman or a python strangling a toddler or many other examples and even a cassowary killing his own owner. So it's not only deadly accident, it's only incidents, for example, from escaped exotic pets. And it's so important in some countries that there is even a search engine about it. Like for example, Born Free has developed this, this engine where you can look for a specific accident based on species and stuff. So it's, it's an, import, an important problem. Second thing is the impact on biodiversity. When you get a dog, a, a pup or anything like that, you most of the time go to a pet shop, a breeding facility, a shelter, or maybe some friend of yours is gonna give one to you. But when you wanna acquire one of those individuals, how do you do it? Where, where do you get them? And more importantly, where are they coming from? So, like for dogs, they can come from breeding facilities. You can acquire them on pet shops, online shops, or more or less legal markets. But there are also a large proportion of those individuals that are actually wild caught, put directly in the pet shop, or this is the tricky part. It's when they are wild caught and put in a breeding facility. So it could be a long time ago, and then you get you get uh, animals that are truly captive bred, meaning that their parents were captive bred, their grandparents were captive bred. So at the end, you have an individual that are truly captive bred. But it could also mean that you capture a pregnant female in the wild and put her to a breeding facility. And once she gets their, her babies, the babies are called wrenched. So their the mother is well caught, but themselves are kind of wrenched. And you have the worst option where you actually capture individuals in the wild, put them in the breeding facilities, and the breeding facilities launder them, telling it's wild caught, um, telling them it's captive brand while it's wild caught. So I wanted to illustrate this with, um, with the example of the most popular pet snake in the trade currently, which is the ball python. And the ball python is actually very easy to buy. This is two different ads, one from a French online shop and another one from the, an American one. So you can buy online about Python very easily. And if you look closely at the ad, there is no mention of where these individuals are coming from. And to go further on that topic, I would like to use the work of a very interesting research team that got published in National Geographic recently, and that they, they, uh, they studied the this ball python trade and they showed that uh, within five years over 600,000 ball python were exported from those three countries only and those three countries lies precisely within the range of the ball python so it's actually hard to know from those individuals being exported the true proportion of captive bred for real ranged or wild caught so it's just to illustrate that you actually never sure where, the, where these animals are coming from. And this leads me to the first impact on biodiversity over exploitation, when a large proportion of exotic pests is directly collected in the wild. And there is many examples where the, the, the trade was not sustainable and led 
to the, the decline of the white population. One of these examples is the gray parrot. It has been heavily traded with over 2 million individuals entering the trade. This led to a ban of international trade in 2015, but now the species in the wild is endangered. It's the same for the radiated tortoise, which is endemic to Madagascar, was banned from international trade early in 1975, but still white population declined due to illegal trade, and it's now critically endangered. And sometimes it's so huge that we call it a crisis. That's the case of the Asian songbird crisis that is fueled by the demand for cage birds and concerns hundreds of species, such as the Javan sparrow, almost extinct in the wild due to wild due to overtrapping and illegal trade, black winged mina, common eel mina, and also the Bali starling that actually went extinct in the wild. So it's, it can be a very strong impact. But you could tell me, okay, but I know very good breeding facilities. I'm 100% sure everything is, bred, is captive bred. There is no problem with that. So I'm, I'm all good for the impact on biodiversity. And I will, end, I will tell you, really? Let's talk about invasive species. Invasive species are any non-native species that significantly modifies or disrupts the ecosystem it colonizes. And it's a major biodiversity threat. So I'm gonna, to illustrate that, I'm gonna take the red earth slider, very popular pet turtle in the 80s, 90s. I think you have all seen it, it's very recognizable. And it was, it's a native from the east coast of the US. And in the late 80s or 90s, it was heavily exported, over 50 million individuals. And if you know the species a little bit, it's very cute and very small to start with, but it's growing fast. And he has a life expectancy that is over 20 years and that can even reach 40 years. So it's a long-term commitment. So for, so for many people, it's, it's not something they can do. So there is lots, lots of release in the wild, which is actually not their native uh, habitat, that leads to the establishment of many population. It's actually now established worldwide. This is all the little um, uh, red square and are the established population. And it's now labeled on one of the world's worst invasive species, leading to a ban in the European Union and in Japan as well. And it's because it has many impacts and one of the most important is the impacts on native fresh turtle. So this is a very strong example, but there is many more. Green-colored uh, green pirates um, established worldwide, the gray squirrel uh, competing with the native squirrel, Burmese python being um, a dramatic in, um, impact on, uh, in the Everglades, and all coming from the pet trade. And there are many more potential invaders we don't know about yet. Another important impact is the sanitary risk. I think you have all heard about the emergence of coronavirus and it's linked to the wildlife trade and potentially the role played by pangolin. It's a bit the same with the exotic animals, uh, exotic animal pets, because they might carry numerous virus, bacteria, fungus, or parasites that could provoke a minor to a, to a very deadly disease to you. All those pictures come from disease that you can catch from exotic pets eventually. And there are many more. This is just a word cloud of all the species we know about, and this is not all of them. But there is also all the ones we don't know about yet. And there is a lot of research ongoing about this topic. People looking for new disease we could catch from snakes, tor pet tortoise, uh, birds, but also sugar gliders and many more. And I wanted to attract your attention, especially on that one. This little guy is a cancajou. It's a species that is coming from South America, very popular in the pet trade, especially in Japan right now. And recently, a Japanese research team discovered a new species of nematode, 
a new species of Balisascaris actually in a pet Kankajin in Japan. And that Balisascaris was very closely related to a very deadly one. So we don't know yet if this could be passed on to humans and provoke disease, but this is concerning. Uh, Mari, I have a quick question. Sorry. Yeah. Um, could you explain uh, what a nematode is exactly? Uh, it's a it's an intestinal uh, it's an intestinal worm you could get and that can eventually travel uh, everywhere like echinococcus for example you can get it if you uh, have a contact with contaminated feces and it can end up in your brain. Thank so, you. Oh, that's scary. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the last thing the last thing we should be that should be important for us as well is about is animal welfare. Because when you get an exotic pet, most of them have very specific requirements. Like if you take the sloth example, on the left panel, this is what you're gonna offer to them at, at best. And on the right panel, this is what they normally do, what they normally have access to. And it's the same for many species Great pirates, for example, they're very social animals. They normally live in large flocks. While all you could offer to them is to chain them to a cage with very little contact with their own kinds. And of course, being a slow loris biologist, I have to talk about that guy. And slow loris is nocturnal primates. It's mainly it lives in the canopy. It's mainly gum and, and insects. And if you have that guy in your living room, you could only expose him to, to broad light and offer him some cat food or so, which is gonna lead to health issue, obviously. So it's, it's, it's truly heartbreaking. But there is also what's happening before. This is the face of wildlife trade. This is hundreds of pirates piled in a little cage. This is the face of wildlife trade, tons of turtles. Once again, this is the face of wildlife trade. And I have to talk about slow loris again. I mean, slow loris are very hard to reproduce in captivity. So almost 100% sure if you end up with a slow loris in your living room, it has been through this process, piling up in a cage, a large portion of them dying, and some people even cut their teeth because slow loris are venomous to make sure they won't bite you. So this is the sad truth be, uh, behind the wildlife trade. I also wanted to attract your attention on the role of social media because putting um, cute videos of, uh, of yourself with an um, with, uh, exotic pet is actually very popular. This is a um, few examples I've gathered on the web with like from that couple with a pet cancajou, almost a 200,000 view. This guy telling you to have a pet snake, almost 500,000 view. A leopard gecko eating a trait, over 1 million views. And this guy washing an otter in the bathroom scene, over 27 million view. So it's huge. And I have to talk about the anaconda in the living room, almost 9 million views. And of course, the slow lorry is eating a rice ball over 30 million views. So it's all of this is actually promoting having an exotic pet and he has, he has bad consequences. I'm gonna use the words of um, National Geographic that made a, a nice paper on that um, recently with just that. Don't be fooled by social media. Wild animals make terrible pets plus you're gonna promote all the things I've just described to you. And in my opinion, anything trivializing owning an exotic pet should be avoided. And I just wanted to briefly discuss the case of Exotic Animal Cafe. It's a, a white phenomenon. I mean, it's a phenomenon that is getting more and more important here in Japan, but in other countries as well. Most of you have probably heard about the Howl Cafe. But it's not only this, it's also many other species like penguins, reptiles, otters, actually hundreds of species. And this is part of the same phenomenon. And once again, 
in my opinion, should be avoided. So my take home message on this talk is that exotic pets are bad news for people's safety and health, biodiversity and animal welfare, obviously. You should never release an exotic pet in the wild. Even after my talk, if you realize, oh my goodness, I have an exotic pet, what should I do? Don't put it in the wild, okay? Um, and I believe strongly that promoting exotic pets via social media should be avoided. So this is about it, about what I wanted to tell you about the exotic pet. But I just want to replace that in, that in its broader context. I told you at the beginning that the exotic pet is only a small portion of what wildlife trade is. And wildlife trade concerns thousands of species, including plants. And maybe in another nerd night session, I could talk about what's wrong with the wild plant trade and taking maybe the cactus example. So yeah, that's uh, all I wanted to tell you today. So I'm, I'm ready for any, any question. Okay, thank you so much, Marie. Uh, that's a great, uh, great talk and a fun topic. We're going to have to actually have to get you back for the uh, cactus <laughs> in the living room because while we've seen, you know, uh, owl cafes out there, I don't think there's a lot of uh, cactus petting uh, cafes out there. So it might not be as a, actually a familiar topic to mm -hmm. some, uh, some people. Okay, uh, well, uh, thank you very much. Um, if you will go into Q&A, so if you could uh, like unshare uh, your screen. And yeah. um, so now uh, we're gonna go and take questions from our audience for about 10 minutes. Uh, okay. People who have any questions, we'll start with the people in the Zoom call right now. Uh, people on the Zoom call, if you have questions, you're welcome to type them in the chat or uh, unmute yourself and ask a question. After that, we will go into the a YouTube chat. So anybody on the YouTube chat, please go ahead and type, as what Katie has written, go ahead and type your question in there and we'll ask it here. All right, uh, the floor is open. Okay, so Kenneth has one question. Please, Kenneth, if you can ask. Hello, everyone. Uh, so yeah, I had a question. I think it was very interesting to mention the difference between uh, domestic species against wild species and the fact that it's not the same at all. But I think I've noticed in social media more and more the uh, like the a growing arguments of people in favor of owning wild animals saying that cats and dogs, for instance, also come from wild species and they've been selected. So why shouldn't we now st start to domesticate otters or tigers or wild cats or anaconda? What would you say uh, in this regard? Uh, it's a tricky question. I, I could have, there is two things to me. First will be, why? Why do we need more pets? I mean, there is already a good selection of things. I mean, there is over 300 bred of, of dogs. So already, I think it's like 290 breads of dogs and 50 of cats. So I think the, the choices there, the options are, are present. The second thing is that domestication is a long process. So if you believe, I mean, you, you will start a dom, I mean, it's not, it's not you can process domestication. It's, I'm sorry, I'm being a bit confused there, but it's, um, it's not that simple. And it's not, we can, we can start, it's not, it's for some reason that we only have a couple of species that have been domesticated truly. Some species may have good pet materials like wolf, because they have to start with good communication skills. You know, for, for being a pet, it's important. So I don't really know where you're gonna end up with a turtle, what, what it's gonna bring to you. It's also a question of what are you expecting from a pet? So it's, it, I find it a hard question to answer. The uh, in, in adding to that, the entire process of having to domesticate an entire 
species is not as simple as a couple of generations breed bred in captivity, I take it. You'd have to like select the docile, the more the yeah. ones more um, amicable to uh, to human interactions. But once again, it depends on what you're looking for. Some people just want to have a black mamba in in a little box, so they are not really interested in domestication, I believe. So, but yeah, you're right. It's a long process. Yeah, if I may, I think I've heard the la latest estimation for dogs domestication ranges between ten and forty thousand years process. Mm -hmm which is probably a long time to hope reaching domestication for social media, I guess. <laughs> we got to get started now, don't we? <laughs> the first domesticated python coming to you in 20,040. <laughs> okay, we've got one question from the YouTube. Uh, Matt is asking that apart from avoiding the things that you mentioned, like ex exotic uh, cafes and things like that. What would be the ways to reduce these issues, do you think, Marie? Like, are there any charities that focus on it, for example? Yes. Um, yes, they are. You can, first, you can um, support uh, charities or that are um, invested in protecting species uh, in the wild. For example, there is some on Slow Loris, there is some on on, uh, on radiated tortoise, all those species that are impacted by the, the wildlife trade. So I think that could be a, a good way to start. And also, even around you, uh, if you have friends that are talking about like, oh, this is cute, I could get an otter. Maybe just around you, you can spread the words and try to explain why you don't think it's a good idea. Yeah, thank you. I agree. It's definitely, it's difficult, right? Because everybody loves those cute pet videos. And I think sort of being that person in the corner saying, ah, actually, this is not such a good thing. It's quite a difficult thing to do, even though I definitely agree with you. Yeah, and you can, on the social media, you can also unlike, and mm. there is, a, depending on the videos, but there is a button you can press if you believe it's animal abuse, mm. because lots of them are, actually. So you can still try to report, but I won't lie, it's, uh, we do that for the slow lorries, but we are overwhelmed with the people actually like it. Right, right, right. Oh, thank you. Hi, Ma Mahi. So I have a question because you said that people that know that they have uh, illegal uh, animals, they shouldn't release. So what would be the indication for that? Like, what should they do if they are willing to um, give it back, let's say? There is several options. I think uh, there is many shelters that will uh, accept those individuals. Most of them cannot go back in the wild. Don't believe that you will be able to put them in the wild because in the first place, you don't know where they're coming from. So it's going to be a long and costly process. So for me, those individuals are doomed. Uh, they won't participate to the survival of their species, but giving them to a shelter, trying, because there is so many species, it's actually hard to know, but you have to get some information and also you can still, yeah, you know, that give them to shelters or places that have good, good uh, equipment will be always better than in your living room. That's, that will be my answer. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. You mentioned how social media uh, impacts uh, the wildlife trade and, uh, and people wanting to, uh, you know, own, own exotic animals. Uh, there's obviously been uh, cases like times before social media where, you know, there was a boom in exotic animals. Uh, are there any are there any like films or shows on like television that you could point to that? may have like directly directly or indirectly caused uh, like a boom in some kind in an exotic in the consumption of a specific kind of exotic pet it's been discussed uh, some uh, researchers think for example that Harry Potter movies have been uh, promoting the keeping owls as pets 
there is also some uh, some belief that maybe finding Nemo has been uh, having uh, an influence on uh, keeping clown uh, fish. So there is a couple of examples that are uh, that are pinpoint yes. We have any more questions from the uh, audience? Oh, we got something from uh, the YouTube. Mm, yeah, so Victoria just asked, so are there any laws or rules for exotic pet trade in Japan, especially keeping and getting exotic pets? Yeah, so mm, she said, she meant to miss the beginning of the talk. So I think maybe we mentioned a little bit, but yeah, if you could go. Yeah, it's. Uh, I didn't go into details that much mm. because it's very strongly between the countries, but Japan has, it's kind of a trick in Japan because uh, there is a ban or international ban of importing specific uh, species in Japan. For example, many primates are banned from importing for infectious uh, risks. Mm. But once the animals are in Japan, it's actually the, the legislation is not strong. And um, so basically you can almost own everything in Japan even though if even if the animal has been poached, actually, even if it has been smuggled in Japan, and you see that in the some of the, the exotic pets, some, for example, are displaying slow loris. And slow loris are banned from international trade. So where are they coming from? There is no captive breeding facilities in Japan in a, for a slow loris, apart from a, one species, but it's very expensive and they only have few births every year. So the species you could see in some of those cafes are a species there is no captive, no breeding facilities. So they are for sure smuggled. But still, once you have them, once the smuggle is being successful, there is nothing that prevents you from keeping it. So it's a, it's a bit tricky. In other countries, you could have like in France, there is a list of species, you especially dangerous species, um, Japan has a bit as that for dangerous species, but apart from tigers and big stuff like that. In France, there is many species you cannot have unless you have some kind of a qualification. But those countries are very rare. In the US, for example, I don't think there is anything about you. Uh, you can have a tiger, it's no problem. Mm. Okay. I think when uh, Tiger King st uh, started, there was a bunch of articles talking about the exotic tech trade, and one of the surprising statistics was there's more there are more tigers in captivity in the u.s and there are actually in nature globally which yeah which is absolutely horrifying because mm -hmm. then it's like oh the the people like the i forgot what the guy's name is they're the those are the kinds of people who have all the all these uh, exotic animals and, and tigers specifically mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I have a I have a question. Um, there's, I don't know if you know, there's a fairly famous Instagram account, uh, Juniper Fox, is a fox, and she oh. says that uh, like her foxes are rescued from fur farms, and she has some other animals as well. There's, I know she has a sugar glider. I don't know if that's from a shop or uh, rescued. And she sort of she makes very cute videos about them, but she's also very careful about saying you know, these are from fur farms, you should not get a fox because they're very difficult to look after. And there's a lot of like in the comments, there's a lot of uh, discussion about, you know, whether that's okay or not. So yeah, I'm interested in your opinion in that kind of situation where they're kind of rescued from a farm or something like this. I, it's tricky because you have to find those individuals at home. And um, it's maybe, I don't, I don't know that person, maybe she's doing great work, but there is always that possibility when you promote it on social media, you people are going to get the wrong right. message. And especially if you promote it in a cute way. I mean, you can promote your action in some way that will be less likely to, to, to make people willing to have a fox. So I think it's also a question on how you promote your action. And I'll say, not knowing the background and stuff, but too much cuteness is not what you're looking for. Mm. Right, right, right. It's kind of like she's kind of saying one thing, but doing another doesn't quite match that one. Yeah, and mm. there is lots of, um, 
lots of people, I, I don't know about that person once mm -hmm. again, but lots of people are actually using that argument while some, sometimes it's not even true. So because it's right. making them look like the good guy. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, I, I'm looking at their Instagram right it's now. Very it's very cute. Like <laughs> five days ago, they had a thing like, why don't you want to have a fox as a pet? And it is yeah. not helping its cause. <laughs> It's like it's all it's just it's cute well produced uh shots here it doesn't help it's tricky exactly. they do they do talk a lot about uh you know how the how the fox like pisses all over the house and eats all of their stuff and they 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 do make a big point of like you shouldn't do it but they still upload all this content so yeah i'm not quite sure what the mm. what, what they're trying to achieve i guess by posting all of that yeah they probably don't know themselves mm. okay yeah thank you all right, and that's a good place uh, for time. Uh, any kind of other lingering questions people might have? Oh, there's, hold on, I've, there are a couple of things in the chat here. Oh, okay, this is Vanessa's, uh, Vanessa's written out something in the chat that we'll uh, put, we'll try to put on as well. Um, Katie, could you see if you can put those links up on uh, our, the YouTube chat as well later? Am I? Okay. Uh, all right. Any, yeah. So any kind of lingering questions, uh, go ahead and, uh, you know, type him in the chat. We'll ask him uh, later on after all of the speakers, if there are any. Um, and so for now, we will take a five, another five minute break and uh, we'll reconvene here uh, after that. So please go refresh your drinks. Um, I'm trying to stall for time while I try to set this timer here. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, we'll and we'll be right back.
Happy New Year! Happy New Year! Hey, we're back. All right. Hello again. Wow, five minutes is really quick. Boy. <laughs> so, uh, so am I coming? I'm coming in all right. Oh, hold on. Just need to readjust a little bit here. Here you go. Uh, okay. So, um, Anna Greg, uh, please go ahead and uh, introduce us to our second speaker for the evening. All right. Thank you. Okay, so um, yeah, so our second speaker today is uh, Yana Kim. She is joining us from all the way from uh, the Netherlands in Europe. Uh, so she's a researcher at Leiden University um, and she studies animal cognition, especially in our evol evolutionary neighbors, the great apes. Um, yeah, uh, there'll be a lot of uh, videos and photos about bonobos which came up in like a past nerd night I remember but um yeah without any further ado I'd like to pass the mic to Yena take it away okie do uh thank you very much for having me here today my name is Yena King and I'm from Leiden University it's uh, 12 no it's less than 12 p.m Okay, but as it's a rule to have a glass of wine or liquor, so I have a wine at 12 and uh, without any breakfast. So cheers first, everybody. Okay, so, <laughs> so I'm gonna share my screen. Uh -huh. Everybody hear my screen? Yep, coming in loud and clear. Okay, and you hear me well? Yep. Okay, let's get started. So the goal of today's presentation is to make you taste a bit of how to study animal, com uh, animal cognition. And I'm gonna give you a very specific example from my recent uh, study on bonobo emotional expressions. Uh, okay, so when you think about research you might think something very sophisticated so that you cannot do you know you cannot really do but actually we are practicing research in our everyday life so imagine you are at a bar after a very tired work you just want to relax yourself with the a glass of martini or whatever, I don't know what that is. But then you suddenly notice that a guy sitting over there is staring at you. Okay, so you stare at him back. And then, okay, this attractive guy makes a nice smile and then asks, how you doing? Okay, oh, this is pretty unexpected. And this is when this curiosity kicks in. And whenever you have this curiosity, then you would question yourself, okay, what is this fucking guy doing? What is the, the meaning of this behavior? What is the purpose of this behavior, right? Then you might have some kind of possible answers or possibilities or yeah potential answers of this guy's this guy's behavior and uh, the most likely he might be into you okay great congratulations but it could be also that he is just such a nice guy so he's just genuinely interested in knowing how others are doing but it also could be that it's just his habit so whenever he has an eye contact it's just so automatic he would react to like this how you doing okay then you want to test how you doing okay so then you might want to test which one among these is the case which one among these is the true case actually the easiest way to figure out is just go directly and ask him okay are you into me i don't know whether it's appealing but uh, you can still try to figure out whether it works. Uh, but in many cases, like me, I'm, I'm quite shy, so I wouldn't be able to do that. Or in many cases, or in most cases, when you study animals, you wouldn't be able to ask them, what are you thinking? So you, we have to take an indirect way to answer this question. So imagine that you, are, you want to test a second hypothesis, which was, 
he is genuinely interested in knowing how others are doing, then you might predict, okay, if he is interested in knowing everybody, how everybody is doing, then you would predict he would ask the same question to anybody in the bar, right? So then you can test this hypothesis. This is an observational approach. And imagine that you want to know whether he makes an eye contact whenever he, uh, whenever, whenever, no. Imagine that you want to test whether he say how you doing whenever you have an eye contact with him. Then you want to have this kind of experimental approach. So you would make more eye contact and more eye contact to him and then count how many times he would, he would repeat this to say, okay? So this is an experimental approach. So basically in everyday life, we do practice the procedure of research. And uh, when uh, it, uh, again, it's the same procedure of conducting a research or animal research. So whenever we have a curiosity, either from our observations or either from a uh, literature survey, then you want to make this curiosity into a testable research questions with hypotheses and predictions. And then what I meant by testable research questions is you have to be able to measure it. You have to be able to quantify it. So based on your hypothesis and predictions, you would then design an observational or experimental study, and then you would measure responses, and then you would test, okay, whether it meets your predictions or not. So basically, this is the procedure of a research. And I hope you get familiarized with this so that we can practice it with a specific example of bonobo emotional expressions. Okay, I think I have to give a little bit of my uh, background or my group background. So I am from Copan Leiden University and Copan is an abbreviation of Comparative Psychology and Effective Neuroscience led by Dr. Mariska Kretz. You see here, yeah. So our group is generally interested in emotion communication, but we not only study explicit facial expression, but we also study some autonomy, more uh, autonomic physiological responses, such as like pupil dilation, heart rate variability, goosebumps, blushing, or skin conduct tons, skin conduct tons, which we cannot actually voluntarily control. And our group not only studies humans, but also studies great apes, uh, especially, uh, yeah, great apes, uh, who has a close uh, common ancestry to understand or to get an insight into the evolution of emotion communication. And one of the most uh, frequently used emotional communication or emotional expressions in human life is a smile. So you, do use a smile when you have an, some kind of positive or happy internal state. So smile not only rep, uh, reflect your positive internal or happiness internal state, but also sometimes, and there are some cases, we have to fake our smiles. And this is, a, this can be, so uh, what you would produce more genuine smile when you are with your friend or more close, partner or somebody like that, but you would sometimes need to fake your smile when you are in front of a supervisor when you get nervous. So studies have found that social relationship matters when we use this smile, and that smile is not only reflecting your internal emotional state, but it's a social signal which can be controlled or which can be manipulated by us. And primates also have this similar facial expression known as bare teeth display. And as you can see here, bare teeth display of chimpanzees or bare teeth display of any other species of primates have a similar morphological characteristics of human smile. And again, this bare teeth display in primates are pretty much found in most primate species. Therefore, it is suggested to be the uh, origin of human smile. And similar to a uh, human smile, primate uh, bare teeth display is known to be influenced by social characteristics, especially social hierarchy, the fitness of the social hierarchy. For example, in the rhesus macaque, which is a species having a very uh, steep hierarchy or the despotic society, they use this bare teeth display only to the dominant individual. So it's very unidirectional. 
and it signals a submission. So in response to threat, it, it just signals a submission to this uh, dominant individual. On the other hand, crested macaques, which is famous for their more tolerant or affiliative society, they use the spiritist display not only unidirectionally, but also bidirectionally. So I do present spiritist display not only to the dominant or older individual, but also to the younger or subordinate individuals. And the spiritist display is not only found in submissive context, but more often in affiliated context. And uh, Proschuft, I don't know whether the pronunciation is correct, and Van Hoff, they propose this power asymmetry hypothesis, basically saying that the power asymmetry among individuals would uh, lead to the use of distinct uh, signal of submission, or it can converge with an affiliative uh, signals. So my curiosity was to figure out what is the or how the Beartes is used in bonobos. And I did a lit literature survey, and actually there are not so many studies out there to explain whether the Beartes is used in particular context or whether the Beartes is influenced by the social rank. So why bonobos? Yeah, I guess you are already familiar with chimpanzees. So bonobos and chimpanzees are super closely uh, related to each other and also to humans. So they also have a very, pretty much the same social organization, but unlike chimpanzees, bonobos have a female-centric society, which means that females are in the center of the society and females often dominate males. So yay, okay. But anyway, so this, uh, due to this uh, female uh, centralized society, they are often described as an affiliative or more tolerant or sometimes an egalitarian species. So if this uh, power asymmetry hypothesis is true, then we would be able to predict, okay, Beartes display in bonobos might be uh, produced regardless of the rank. And also, this Beartes display would be produced not only in the submissive context, but perhaps more often in the affiliative context. So these are the testable research questions that I um, made according to the power asymmetry hypothesis. So this is a bonobo life at Apennol Primate Park. So there's no audio. So here you see bonobos are doing grooming. And this juvenile is drinking milk and the infants are playing over there. So we did this video recording and then uh, coded every behavior. So my student, Yolande from Utrecht University, she did this observation from January to March with 11 bonobos at Apenau Primate Park. And then we have a total of 106 video recordings. And we imported all these videos into the software Boris and uh, this program, and then we coded every social interaction based on when, who did what to whom, and also whether there was a facial expression or what was the facial expression of, the, of this uh, social interaction. So we coded every specific information about each social event. So let's look at the length, rank first. So we kind of uh, predicted that bonobos would have more tolerant uh, social hierarchy, but uh, it wasn't the case. The bonobos in, at Apeno, they have rather a steep hierarchy. And as you can see here, females mostly uh, dominate males. And you see the steepness of the hierarchy. And this is only the data of adult. So we found that, okay, bonobos in this group have rather a steep, hierarchy. So we wanted to know that, okay, whether bonobos do produce spirities regardless of the rank, right? So we checked that and then it turns out actually it was not. So bonobos were more likely to uh, produce their spirities toward the dominant individual, but not really equally. Okay, and we also wanted to know whether bonobos do produce Beartes more flexibly, not only in the submissive context, but also in the affiliative context. And it was 
it wasn't really the case, even though bonobos do use this in a multiple context, they did not show more or the higher proportion of a BRTS display in the affiliative context. Okay, so, ah, okay, sorry. So bonobos uh, produce BRTS display most often in the sexual context, and then I would show you the example of it. Again, there is no audio. So this is when there was a food provision happened, and you will see this alpha female just it's displayed as another individual, and you will see they are having this GG rubbing, genital, genital non-reproductive sexual contact, and then you will see this female banji is making their teeth display. And in bonobos, it is uh, well established that bonobos use this uh, GG rubbing or non-reproductive sexual contact to reduce the tension among them. And uh, when they have a food in front of them, not only in front of them, but when they are anticipating food, already the stress level increase, not only in the behavioral, signal, behavioral signs, but also in actual your cortisol level as well. So whenever they have this stressful environment, then they do use this GG rubbing to reduce the tension. And while they were GG rubbing, they produce the spiritis uh, display. And we also check that whether immatures are using the spiritis display, but we analyzed it separately because we didn't have an information about the rank for the immatures. And what we found that uh, for the immatures, spiritis was more kind of uh, used or produced more flexibly than the adult. And this is an example of uh, immatures making bare teeth display. So this is actually recorded while I was doing eye tracking experiment. So this uh, video screen you see here is, um, is recorded from a webcam installed above the monitor. So you will see this. This is the nozzle where they drain the juice while they are uh, viewing the screen. So this is a, just an example to give you an idea how they would make their teeth display. So this uh, three immatures are having fun. Okay, actually it was her turn to participate in the eye tracking, but then these two guys are also interested in this in joining this so then the tension increases and then the this female the juvenile is making juju robbing with the infant over there and you, you see this uh, infant it he was one year one year and a half year old uh, one year and a half years old yes hopefully and then uh, he was uh, making this uh, explicit uh, beauty's displays so what does my study tell? First of all, bonobos, especially in this particular uh, group of bonobos are not egalitarian. They rather have a steep hierarchy. And actually it was a, there was a huge variation across study population, especially captive populations. And the Beartes in bonobos, especially in this population used as a signal indicating social status as a subordination, to indicate a subordination. And although Bertis was used in a more flexibly or in not only in the submissive context, but it, this was not found in the affiliative context. And also immature individuals, uh, they use more uh, Bertis more flexibly, which may indirectly show that immature individual may learn the proper use of Bertis throughout their environment so that they can finally tune. So yeah, I have to give a take a message, right? So actually I was given a mission from the conserve session that I had to connect my talk to animal welfare, conservation, and also environmental issues. But actually the topic itself is not really directly to relate, directly related to welfare or conservation or whatever. But then I kind of realized that while you were listening to my talk, you may already feel like feel connected to at least bonobos because you now know more about them, right? So, and also 
as you already heard the story, uh, the talk by Marie, you would also feel more connected or you would care more about animal welfare or animal conservation. So my mission to you is please connect yourself to bonobos or non-human animals or the mother nature by joining this kind of event more and more frequently because the only way you feel more connected to the other is to get to know more about them. So hopefully I give a, a sort of a connection you with at least to Bonobos. And with that, I'd like to yeah, thank everybody for yeah, your listening and attention. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Yena. Uh, what, a what a great talk. Uh, so yeah, I guess we will, uh, now move on to questions. Okay. And so anybody, uh, right now on, uh, the zoom call, they're welcome to ask, uh, any questions and then we can move on to, uh, to the YouTube. Okay, okay. Breaking. Whoa. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Is it okay? Yes. <laughs> I was going to say breaking the ice with a maybe stupid question, but technical question, you know. Um, when you were filming your screen on the computer and filming this GG rubbing, you were shaking the camera. Was that on purpose or <laughs> was that totally. Uh, just, <laughs> uh, just actually, I don't know if you noticed, but um, yeah, we were ooh. wondering yeah, what's going on. Really? Uh, actually, I have to ask my student whether she was a rose during filming this, but it's taken by my students. So, yeah, okay. even though I feel it's quite an inappropriate to ask that question, but uh, <laughs> if you really insist, I can ask. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. That was just to break the ice. So now it's all over to, okay. to the others. Really? I don't think the ice is uh, broken, but let's see. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, if it, it kind of, uh, you know, just to make sure to make that we don't have any awkward <laughs> awkward silence here. Um, mm -hmm. you, you talked about bonobos, uh, and obviously, is this a common trait you see in uh, the other higher uh, in, in the other uh, great, great apes as in, so does this happen in chimpanzees? Is it also found in orangutans? Uh, what do you mean? Like oh, the, the, the or? Yeah, the, the bear teeth display as a um in or, or like is there a different context if they actually do do bare teeth display ah uh, yes of course so, so actually this is a part of a comparative study that i actually having a data collection right now with the chimpanzees at artists do in the netherlands so the the main idea is that the prediction that i had the chimpanzees since they have more steep hierarchy than bonobos i expected this bear teeth display would be more directed toward dominant individual and then would be have would be more present in the submissive context. But actually this uh, was the opposite of what I expected because it, the exactly uh, this kind of uh, predictions were found in bonobo population. So I am still uh, in the uh, in the process of data collection of chimpanzees so that we can actually directly compare with regard to that but the already previous studies show that chimpanzee verities display not only indicate the submission but also like benign intent or more affiliative intent so yeah and how, how about orangutans or is there any data regarding that uh, yeah, of course, there is also a study about bear teeth display in orangutans. Orangutans also not really systematically investigated with regard to power asymmetry hypothesis, but orangutans do also have this bear teeth display, and then researchers uh, uh, suggest this would indicate their kind of teeth stretch. Yeah. Looks like we have Kenneth with their hand up. 
-hmm. Yes. Hi, Anna. Thanks for the question, the presentation. That was nice. Um, I yeah, was yeah, wondering yeah. if you have or any other scientist have ever considered trying to smile to different primates to see their reaction, like for science, actually. I believe mm -hmm. there is a, quite a potential for an ignoble price in that. So what do you think? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I don't know whether I would design that kind of experiment, but I have a story uh, from a zoo in Rotterdam. So there was this uh, visitor who was so in love with gorillas. And then this visitor has no idea about the gorilla behavior repertoire. And then the for us, eye-to-eye -eye contact means uh, some kind of attachment. We are connected uh, to each other when we have an eye contact. So this, uh, this visitor make a direct eye contact with the alpha male of gorilla. And then it, and she, she, yeah, I guess it was she, she ended up gorilla escaping and uh, snatched her and then, uh, yeah, injured her. So, I don't know whether I would design an experiment <laughs> of making a social smile to uh, social smile to different species of primates to figure out whether they would interpret the way we signal or whether they would interpret the way they perceive in their uh, in their species repertoire. But it, it could be that it would be an interesting experiment, uh, but I wouldn't do it. <laughs> yeah. Hope I have answered your On the question. more serious one, has any mm -hmm. interspecific mm -hmm. uh, studies done on Bertie's signaling in primates? Interspecies uh, Bertie's signaling, as far as I know, not the signaling part, but there is interspecies uh, emotional express. It's a perception of emotional expressions, and actually, I did run uh, recently the study in human population uh, in humans. So I presented uh, bonobo emotional expression, facial expressions to humans, and actually, people most confused with the Bertis displays with the like play face display. So they basically thought Bertie's display, since it's morpho morphologically similar to human smile, so they thought it is a positive emotional, having a positive emotional valence and it would be the signal of happiness or something like that. So I would say the way we, or the way a species perceive a certain facial expression or a certain stereotype of behavioral expression would be pretty much determined by their species uh, repertoire. Yep. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, there's a couple of questions from the YouTube viewers, so I'll ask those ones. Okay, so first of all, uh, Matt asks, uh, considering how humans can fake a smile or other emotions, have you found that bonobos or other animals have that same complexity in facial body experience? expression and character. So I guess like, can you tell the difference between sort of a true uh, bare teeth or a fake one, something like this? Uh, actually, there was a very recently, recently published paper in, uh, in I, I don't remember exactly the, the name of the species because I just briefly scanned yesterday, but they indeed did uh, analyze, decode all the spatial uh, action unit and then they found that actually the the same bear teeth di display is actually different in slightly different context mm. so like we make like genuine smile with like uh, like this and also the eyes and the eyebrows as well and they also do have this kind of variation according to the specific kind of context where they produce this bear teeth display mm. so they do have definitely has a voluntary control and they do have definitely have used uh, has an ability to use this in a 
uh, depending on the certain context. Mm, yeah. So from for for me personally, what you said so far, it sounds like it's more on purpose, right? Rather, whereas for humans, we smile involuntarily, but if it's from a submissive to a dominant, it's mm, mm, you know, mm, it's mm, a choice. So yeah. mm, it seems like it's kind of always fake. I suppose something like this. It sounds. Oh, really uh, it's not. It's not really always fake. So mm. you definitely have this genuine or more mm. autonomic responses, but at the same time, the, you have a control over this uh, all the facial expression or facial muscle movement. So you can actually voluntarily control and fake if it's necessary, but it doesn't really rule out the fact that it also reflects your internal. Uh, true motivation mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay thank you nice and then there's, there's one more question from the youtube as well uh they say thomas says uh in animals which bt is unidirectional unidirectional yeah towards dominant yep, individuals yep, yep. what happens mm -hmm. when the hierarchy is changed so when one steps up and becomes alpha does it suddenly stop smiling to the others mm, of course it should be otherwise there is a huge risk to be attacked by uh, this dominant who just become dominant, right? So the reason why in the despotic species have a, such a unidirectional way of uh, expressing their teeth is because to reduce reduce the risk of being attacked by mis-signaling. Mm. So they should be able to adjust their behavior according to the current situation as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that would be something really interesting to study if you ever have that situation. Yep. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I thank you. Okay, I think. Okay. Do we have any other questions from anybody? I actually have one if there aren't any others. Um, I was just simply curious how the situation has been um, when you have to study bonobos and great apes in captivity during this uh, COVID situation. Like, are you able to uh, be in contact with them or like how, how is the distancing and stuff going right now? Exactly. Uh, that's a very good question. So we were not allowed to until very recently, we were not allowed to go to a zoo. And in the Netherlands, we were really recommended to work from home. Mm. So yeah, I wasn't really able to go to a zoo and then do or resume my research back. There. But uh, now we have a permission from artists too in, the, uh, in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. So from next week, I would be able to go back. But then we have all this protocol for the strict uh, prevention, the prevention of the disease spread. So I will wear the oldest mask and also the face shield as well, and then wear a uh, gown and also the boots as well, experimental boots. And then whenever we go into the aid area, we will disinfect our hands and everything. So we will try to yeah strictly follow the protocol that we made. I see. Yep. Thank you. Are there like um, normal, not normal, non-researcher mm -hmm. like visitors at zoos? Are they do they have to take precautions or are they even allowed to visit zoos? In oh, right actually, now? they are allowed to go to a zoo, but they have to make a reservation in advance, mm -hmm. and also they do have this kind of social distancing measures. Mm -hmm. But uh, things are quite loosened here compared to Japan or compared to Korea, I would say. So mm, not really many people are wearing mask, masks oh. outside. So even in the zoo, they are not really wearing a mask. But uh, uh, there is a, a, quite a huge distance between uh, humans and also between animals and there is this uh, enclosure with the uh, let's say a uh, glass wall or things like that so I think there is no report yet except in some kind of uh, like no no in some kind of farms there is no yeah report of uh, disease transmission from or corona transmission from humans to other wild animals at a zoo I see I see 
Thank you. Yeah, I was just curious because thank you. In in Japan, we just had our um, I think three day, four day holiday, and、mm-hmm. there were reports on、um, you know the different tourist attractions and different cities,、mm-hmm. and some zoos were like really really crowded, and some of the、um, enclosures are open、uh, displays.、Yeah. So I was kind of thinking,、hmm, like, is this really okay? And like, how is it in other countries? So yeah. True. Really yeah. interesting. I think、hear. the approach is a bit different from、mm-hmm. like Japan and here. I think. Yeah. yeah. Seems like it. But yeah, thank you also for、uh, the mission for completing our mission of. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really I, thought deeply. <laughs> yeah. Very yeah. very nice、um, take yeah, home message. I think. <laughs> Yeah, we have one more question from the YouTube. That's right. Okay.、Uh, Abdullah asks.、Uh, they say, in animals in which BT happens bidirectionally, do the、mm-hmm. higher ranks tend to show less aggressiveness within the group? Ah, yeah. Also, there is a study、uh, showing that when they have、uh, bare teeth display, whether the recipient will have more or less.、Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, aggression, and it it turns out when they have more,、uh, when they do produce bare teeth display in response to threat or potential threat, then they have less likelihood、mm-hmm. to have an aggression.、Mm-hmm. So it a- actually has a function to reduce the risk of、uh, attack or and or to, to facilitate social bonds between、mm-hmm. uh, diet in diet. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Thanks. Yep.、Yeah. Okay. Oh, we have. Looks like we have a hand up from Kuila Lim. Oh. Hi, good evening. Yeah.、Mm. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just thinking about、uh, when I look at the bare teeth、uh, display.、Mm-hmm. I just remember the video that I saw in maybe YouTube. So it was like a guy was playing music and then clapping hands, and then、mm. the chimpanzee, I think maybe in the center or something, was doing the same、mm. thing and showing teeth. And then、uh, the people comments below there, YouTube were like, "Oh, this chimps look very、really、happy, you know. I just play, you just like, you know,、mm. follow the music, you know, rhythm, and then just dance along." But then there are also people who said like, you know, when they show teeth, they are like being aggressive. They don't like it, you know. Do you have such?、Mm-hmm, I mean.、Mm-hmm. I'm, Because you see, work with it, so I wonder if you have any like、uh, such experience in social media where you have to explain to people that this is not what you think.、Mm-hmm. Yeah.、Uh, well, I haven't had any experience myself explaining in the social media that this is wrong because I. Don't do social media very often, or I, I try not to do. So, but I,、uh, for example, my group in Korea,、uh, we are uh, more uh, kind of contributing to that side of、uh, mm-hmm. like a conservation or like to animal welfare. So, whenever we have this kind of.、Uh, Misinformation coming from this on, on social media, then we try to、uh, correct the、mm. the misinformation and、right. then repost it. But、uh, by myself, I I haven't done it. Yeah. Well,、oh, but thank you. Yeah. It's enough. Yeah, and thank、way. you for a really interesting presentation. Yeah, I thank you too as well. Thank you. Yeah. And、kind of、uh, with what you and、uh, Anna Gret was just talking about, how we can go like a whole two hours on just how the COVID situation has changed,、uh, mm. especially animal researchers and like、yeah. the because going out into the field. So to、so、some people, like yeah,、exactly. you have to go out into the field. Yeah,、um, true. And、uh, Anna Gret, if you want to.、Uh, bring out a couple of people who can talk about、mm. that. We're more than welcome.、Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely know a couple, and I'm sure Vanessa, Cecile, and 
yeah, people from, uh, I guess, our discipline, yeah, have been suffering <laughs> quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But I think the situation is, you know, getting better in, mm -hmm. in some labs. Um, I've heard from people that uh, they should try to stay indoors two weeks before they go out to the field. And mm -hmm. it also depends on the, the species they study. So mm -hmm. I work with birds, so there's no real, like, threat um, to mm -hmm. the birds. But yeah, primates and mammals, cats especially, are. Mm -hmm. I've heard that yeah, it's quite difficult right now. So yeah. Okay. Oh wow! We actually did did quite a long uh, Q and A session there. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, we're, we're I'm going to take any kind of lingering questions. So, uh, you know, whoever has any questions, speak now or forever hold your peace. Uh, well, if you do have any kind of additional questions, you are welcome to either contact the speakers themselves or you can contact the, uh, us, the, the Nerd Night group uh, our, uh, through Facebook or on our website, then we can forward that to uh, the speakers if they um, for them to answer. Oh, I just saw something coming up from the YouTube. So uh, Katie, could you go ahead and read that? Yeah, out? we'll do one more then. Okay, so yeah, so Thomas again. Thomas says, uh, are there occasions within groups of bi-directional BT display where the higher hierarchies might consider the BT display from lower ones to be some sort of disrespect? Mm. Mm. Higher, higher ranked individuals consider the low ranked individuals bear teeth display disrespect. Mm. Uh, I assume the question is asking whether certain bear teeth display morphologically, the certain bear teeth display can be considered inappropriate in certain species it, when it directed it to higher individuals. I have to look it up, but I, as far as I know, I don't think there is a study done so far to specifically analyze the facial like action unit, like, like I explained before, with regard to the consequence of it. So I think it should be investigated later, but as far as I know, there is no study about that. Okay, yep. thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs> thank you. Yep. Uh, I guess that's, that'd be a good place to uh, wrap up. Yeah, let's finish up. That. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Yena and uh, uh, Marie as well for the two fantastic talks. Another great round of applause for everybody. Uh, <laughs> well, well muted. Um, Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for everybody uh, for joining us on Zoom and on YouTube. We will be uh, continuing to do uh, their night, their nights for for sure, uh, and they're uh, pretty much going to be online uh, at least for the next couple of more times, just to just to make sure <laughs> and to keep things safe. Uh, however, in the meantime, the other venues that uh, Katie and I usually uh, use for Nerd Night to host, uh, that is Lingua World Cafe, uh, the Urban Guild Live House here in Kyoto, and Gojo Guest House. These three places, they're, uh, full, they're, they're open and they're operating. Uh, Gojo Guest House, unfortunately, you know, that's a, a guest house. So their cafe is open, but they're, you know, there's nobody traveling around in Japan, so they don't have any people staying there. But the cafe is open, uh, and then, and so uh, I don't know, Katie. Do you want to talk about what our? Uh, do we have a date for the next one? Yes. So our next one is going to be the 25th of October, and so far we have. Uh, 
my friend Alice is going to be talking about diversity in Japanese video games, like uh, the or lack of diversity, which should be very interesting. And then uh, myself and uh, a friend from Tokyo are going to be talking about polyamory and how that works in society today and in Japan. So that should be very good as well. Oh, yeah. All right. So, yeah, please come join. It's going to be good. October 25th. That's a Sunday. 25th, at the, at the, Sunday. At the same bat time, same bat yeah, channel. Yeah, right American, here. yeah. So, yes, there'll be more info about that on Facebook soon. And if you are interested uh, in speaking at a future nerd night uh, after October uh, we, and, you know, into 2021, you're welcome to contact us through our Facebook, our Twitter, our, web, our, our uh, website, and especially to our speakers today, please uh, point your finger at the next person who should uh, jump on uh is jump on zoom with us because now you know since it's all online there's really no excuse of saying oh it's a pain in the ass to travel to kyoto or to go to mm. osaka <laughs> um i would like to hand off to anna Gret as well uh for any kind of closing statements if you have any yeah thank you so yeah i'd just like to thank you all again for joining and thank you so much to the speakers um, joining us from all the way from Aichi and the Netherlands. Um, it's quite a special occasion to have multiple time zones. And yeah, it's really happy. I'm, I'm really happy that this worked out very well today. And I think um, I said earlier, but Yena really wrapped it up very nicely at the end of her presentation. Um, so one of our aims at Conserve Session is to reach out to the public and kind of have people uh, be more acquainted with uh, issues about animals or just even knowing more about them because that is really what drives, um, I guess, compassionate action towards uh, saving uh, the environment and things like that. So thank you, Yena, again <laughs> for that. And uh, we will have more events coming up pretty soon. Uh, we are planning one, uh, an online event um, and uh, we're thinking of doing something related to and portrayal of animals so this is kind of uh at a great you just cut out for a second there today. could you repeat that again what, oh did the, I? the topic sorry. yeah sorry sorry yeah so uh the plan is for now is to do an event an online event about uh animals and their portrayal in media uh kind of related to what was being discussed here today so uh, if you guys are interested in these kinds of things, uh, you can follow us on uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and we also have uh, our website on Kyoto University's uh, primate, uh, Primatology and Wildlife Science uh, Leading Graduate Program. We have a little uh, news uh, post that the officers do for us sometimes. So um, yeah, is there anything from PRI, Vanessa and Cecile, anything that you want to fill in? Now we want to thank to thank the presenters again. Thank you, Yena. Thank you, Mahi. And well, looking forward to the next meeting and next conservative session and next nerd nerd net too. Well, thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. Uh, I want to get like a last like a kanpai shot uh, for a screen grab so we can use it on our social media. So everybody grab a glass or <laughs> what have you. And also people joining on Zoom as well, they're welcome to. But uh, I guess, uh, otsukare sama deshita. We'll do a kanpai. Otsukare sama deshita. Otsukare sama deshita. All right. Well, thank you very much, and uh, we'll we'll see you we'll see you all of you hopefully back here next month. All right, bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye, thank bye. You everyone.